But let us not forget in what must be part four or five by now. No, four. It'll be in the title. Um, Jefferson was one of those slave masters that wanted to be the good, you know, be nice to your slaves. They produce better. Unless you have to beat them if they don't, you know, but hopefully, and if you do have to beat them, have somebody else do it. You don't want to see that ugliness. It seems that Jefferson grew uneasy about Lily's regime at the nailery. Jefferson replaced him with William Stewart, but kept Lily in charge of the adult crews building his mill and canal. Under Stewart's lenient command, Perrin, greatly softened by habitual drinking, on the part of Stewart, I assume, and Perrin, the nailery's productive the nailery's productivity sank. The nail boys favored... It's hard to make wisecracks and then actually keep on the right thing. Maybe I should just read. The nail boys, favored or not, had to be brought to heel. In a very unusual letter, Jefferson told his Irish master joiner, James Dinsmore, that he was bringing Lily back to the nailery. It might seem puzzling that Jefferson would feel compelled to explain a personal decision that had nothing to do with Dinsmore, but the nailery stood just a few steps from Dinsmore's shop. Jefferson was preparing Dinsmore to witness scenes under Lily's command such as he had not seen under Stuart, and his tone was stern, quote, I am quite at a loss about the nail boys remaining with Mr. Stuart. They have long been a dead expense instead of profit to me. In truth, they require a vigor of discipline to make them do reasonable work, to which he cannot bring himself on the whole. I think it will be best for them to be removed to Mr. Lilly's control. Let freedom ring. The incident of horrible violence in the nailery, the attack by one nail boy against another, may shed some light on the fear Lilly instilled in the nail boys. In 1803, a nailer named Carey smashed his hammer into the skull of a fellow nailer, Brown Colbert. S seized with convulsions, Colbert went into a coma and would certainly have died had Colonel Randolph not immediately summoned a physician who performed a brain surgery. With a trephine saw, the doctor drew back the broken part of Colbert's skull, thus relieving pressure on the brain. And amazingly, the man survived. I feel I'm going to get an ad. No. Bad enough that Carey had so viciously attacked somebody, but his victim was a Hemings. Jefferson, oh, there is a little ad, but not that. Jefferson angrily wrote to Randolph that it, quote, it will be necessary for me to make an example of him in terrorium to others in order to maintain the police so rigorously necessary among the nail boys. He ordered that Carey be sold away, quote, so distant, as never more to be heard of among us, end quote. And he alluded to the abyss beyond the gates of Monticello into which people could be flung. Quote, there are generally Negro purchasers from Georgia passing about the state, end quote. Randolph's report of the incident included Carey's motive. The boy was, quote, irritated at some little trick from Brown who hid part of his nail rod to tease him. End quote. But under Lily's regime, this trick, was, this trick was not so little. Colbert knew the rules, and he knew very well that if Carey couldn't find his nail rod, he would fall behind, and under Lily, that meant a beating. Hence the furious attack. Just a little joke. Jefferson's daughter, Martha, wrote to her father that one of the slaves, a disobedient and disruptive man named John, tried to poison Lily, perhaps hoping to kill him. John was safe from any severe punishment because he was a hired slave. If Lily injured him, Jefferson would have to compensate his owner, so Lily had no means to retaliate. John, evidently grasping the extent of his immunity, took every opportunity to undermine and provoke him, even, quote, cutting up Lily's garden and destroying his things, end quote, according to a letter that this historian read. Who knows? But Lily had his own kind of immunity. He understood his importance to Jefferson when he renegotiated his contract so that beginning in 1804, he would no longer receive a flat fee for managing the nailery, but be paid 2% of the gross. 
productivity immediately soared. In the spring of 1804, Jefferson wrote to his supplier, the manager of my nailery has so increased its activity as to call for a larger supply of rod than had heretofore been necessary. Best not to ask many questions about that, especially since you know how that's working. He's an innovator. Jefferson made this town of slaves, and that's what fucking the United States is. And it's going bankrupt just like him. Ugh. That's why you can't trust Democrats either. A lot of Republicans love this uh, stuff because, you know, he was the start of the Democratic Party. But, but they're the ones that like slavery in the South. So, I don't know. It's an ironic thing. Anyway, you gotta just face the truth. He was a bastard slave owner, right? I think so. Maintaining a high level of activity required a commensurate level of discipline. Thus, in the fall of 1804, when Lily was informed that one of the nail boys was sick, he would have none of it. Appalled by what happened next, one of Monticello's white workmen, a carpenter named James Oldham, informed Jefferson of, quote, the barbarity that Lily made use of with little Jimmy, end quote. Oldham reported that James Hemmings, the 17-year-old son of the house servant Krita Hemmings, had been sick for three nights running, so sick that Oldham feared the boy might not live. <coughs> he took Hemmings into his own room to keep watch over him. When he told Lily that Hemmings was seriously ill, Lily said he would whip Jimmy into working. Oldham, quote, begged him not to punish him, quote, but, quote, this had no effect, end quote. The barbarity ensued. Barbarity in quotes. Lily, quote, whipped him three times in one day, and the boy was really not able to raise his hand to his head. Flogging to this degree does not persuade someone to work. It disables him. But it, is, but it also sends a message to the other slaves, especially those like Jimmy, who belonged to the elite class of Hemming's servants and might think they were above the authority of Gabriel Lily. Once he recovered, Jimmy Hemmings fled Monticello, joining the community of free blacks and runaways who made a living as boatmen on the James River, floating up and down between Richmond and obscure Blackwater villages. Contacting Hemmings through Oldham, Jefferson tried to persuade him to come home, but did not set the slave catchers after him. There is no record that Jefferson made any remonstrance against Lily, who was unrepentant about the beating and loss of a valuable slave. Indeed, he demanded that his salary be doubled to a hundred pounds. This put Jefferson in a quandary. He displayed no misgivings about the regime that Oldham characterized as the most cruel, but a hundred pounds was more than he wanted to pay. Jefferson wrote that Lily as an overseer, quote, is as good a one as can be, end quote. Quote, certainly I can never get a man who fulfills my purposes better than he does, end quote. This is the guy that called overseers the worst, but also most useful, breed of man. On a recent afternoon at Monticello, Fraser Neiman, the head archaeologist, led the way down the mountain into a ravine following the trace of a road laid out by Jefferson for his carriage rides. It passed the house of Edmund Bacon the overseer Jefferson employed from 1806 to 1822, about a mile from the mansion. When Jefferson retired from the presidency in 1809, he moved the nailery from the summit. He no longer wanted even to see it, let alone manage it, to a site downhill a hundred yards from Bacon's house. The archaeologists discovered unmistakable evidence of the shop. Nails, nail rod, charcoal, coal, and slag. Neiman pointed out on his map locations of the shop in Bacon's house. The nailery was a socially fractious place, he said. One suspects that part of the reason for getting it off the mountaintop and putting it right here next to the overseer's house. About 600 feet east of Bacon's house stood the cabin of James Hubbard, a slave who lived by himself. The archaeologists dug more than 100 test pits at this site, but came up with nothing. Still, when they brought in metal detectors and turned up a few wrought nails, it was enough evidence to convince them that they had found the actual site of Hubbard's house. Hubbard 
was an eleven was eleven years old and living with his family in Poplar Forest, Jefferson's second plantation near Lynchburg, Virginia, in seventeen ninety four, when Jefferson brought him to Monticello to work in the new nailery on the mountaintop. His assignment was a sign of Jefferson's favor for the Hubbard family. James's father, a skilled shoemaker, had risen to the post of foreman of labor at Poplar Forest. Jefferson saw similar potential in the sun. At first, James performed abysmally, wasting more material than any of the other nail boys. Perhaps he was just a slow learner, perhaps he hated it, but he made himself better and better at the miserable work, swinging his hammer thousands of times a day until he excelled, and when Jefferson measured the nailery's output, he found that Hubbard had reached the top 90% efficiency in converting nail rod to finished nails. A model slave eager to improve himself, Hubbard grasped every opportunity the system offered. In his time off from the nailery, he took an additional task on additional tasks to earn cash. He sacrificed sleep to make money by burning charcoal, you know, making charcoal, tending a kiln through the night. Jefferson also paid him for hauling a position of trust because a man with a horse and permission to leave the plantation could easily escape. I guess he was consenting to this job, even though he didn't have a choice. Through his in this is sarcasm, through his industriousness, Hubbard laid aside enough cash to purchase some fine clothes, including a hat, knee breeches, and two overcoats. Then, one summer day in 1805, early in Jefferson's second term as president, Hubbard vanished. For years, he had patiently carried out an elaborate deception, pretending to be the loyal, hard-working slave. He had done that hard work not to soften a life in slavery, but to escape it. The clothes was not for show. It was for disguise. Shocking. People want their freedom even when they're treated, and then they... Oh, with all that trust, he betrayed that trust of that kidnap and rapist Thomas Jefferson. Gary's the one that said I should always say the rapist Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> 